And this is an introduction to FireJail, AppArmor, and SE Linux. So I've seen some new faces out in the crowd, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how things are done here. Uh, I'm certified with the state of Arizona as uh, a law enforcement instructor. And so in order to give credit for members of the law enforcement community, military community, so on and so forth, for them to get their continuing education credits, my classes have to be structured in sort of a specific way. Uh, and so this class is done that way. So we're going to start off with our performance objectives. So what are we going to learn? Well, we're going to be able to identify what the Linux kernel security module interface is. We're going to identify what sandboxing is. We're going to identify the tools and their use to develop an AppArmor profile. We're going to identify some of the benefits of sandboxing. And then we're going to describe what SE Linux is and who created it. Everybody knows who created SE Linux? You should know. NSA. NSA, absolutely. OK. So. Is this the politics? They gave it for free. And they did. <laughs> they gave it to us for free. <laughs> uh, that was pretty good. Now I don't feel guilty for the table again. So. Uh, whenever you're implementing Linux into your security rotation, whether you're using it as your daily driver or you're just using it for servers or so on and so forth, uh, there's a lot of moving parts, okay? Uh, particularly within the kernel. Now, I'm going to start off with sort of a famous question, and most of people know this one already, but I'm going to do it again. Who here has read every line of the Linux kernel? What's that? Every line. <laughs> no, not every line. No. Every line. No? None of us? Okay, good. So, one of the arguments is for people to use Linux is that it's more secure. And the reason why it's more secure is because it's open source. Now, we have some pretty advanced people in here and some people who have really done some real computer stuff in here, okay? And whenever I asked who's looked at every line of the kernel, not a single person has raised their hands. There, it's just too big. There's too much stuff going on, and we do have to trust other people. Uh, the, the entire Linux ecosystem is built on trust. It's built on free software. It's built on contributions of the public. And it's built on people trusting each other, OK? So when I get up here and I tell you about the Linux uh, kernel security module and I tell you about all this stuff, what we are doing is we are essentially getting up and we're saying that all of these people who have come forward to contribute to this system, that we have a level of trust in them. And I can tell you whether because of malice or because of accident or because somebody just wants to get paid, all over the place, there are places where there are problems, OK? I guarantee it, no matter what. So with that out of the way, and with that as a um, small warning for everybody, let's go ahead and get into that Linux kernel security module. You have a lot of choices, OK? Especially whenever we're trying to understand the tools and we're trying to understand all of these items that are made available to us for, we, for us to accomplish that entire uh, very vague concept of cybersecurity. What is cybersecurity? Can you really define it? Well, everybody has their own definition. And all I can tell you is, is that my definition of cybersecurity is the idea that I am generally comfortable with the safety of my data and what is going on with my information, generally. Because I can't sit here and tell you that it is 100% defended. But for anybody who's ever been in the military, we can't defend every installation. If you're in law enforcement, we can't defend every 7-Eleven. There's just, it's not possible, OK? There's too much, too much ground to cover, too many places that you would have to be at one time. Exact same thing with your computer, OK? But what we want to do is we want to discuss the most popular kernel level security modules, how they're implemented, and how to help you decide what you want to implement within your own home. So let's talk about the LSM or the Linux kernel security module. Uh, said it a little while ago, I'm say it again, the NSA, a lot of fingers, a lot of people involved in that organization within the kernel. Uh, anybody here able to tell me what the NSA is kind of doing right now? We're trying to implement something into the kernel that uh, people are not very excited about. Very weak encryption for IoT. Anybody heard that yet? So currently, the NSA made a proposal 
and I'm not exactly sure right now where this is uh, exactly ended up, but the, cur uh, the proposal was made that they want to integrate a form of encryption for IoT devices that is supposed to be very easy for an IoT device to process because they're generally low power, right? Things like Raspberry Pis or something smaller. So because they want to implement this into the system, they wrote up a proposal and they sent it in and they said, we want to integrate this encryption. And a gentleman who works on the Linux kernel came back and said, okay, this is great, but explain to us where you got your numbers from because it doesn't make sense to us. And um, for those of you who have been in here before and you know that stare that I give sometimes when I'm asked a question, but I have to very carefully like scale back what I'm gonna say, and so I pause, they pulled that maneuver and then immediately took their proposal and left and were very angry. Uh, there were some complaints made and some fighting going on and so on and so forth. And the last thing I heard was that they were still going to be able to integrate that encryption. But, uh, well, if you build your own kernel, then that's okay because you'll just be able to pop it out. How many people here are running a custom kernel? Yeah, okay. So, most likely, in a few weeks, if not months. Uh, next time you're doing a kernel update, there's a very good chance that you're going to have a very weak form of encryption added to your kernel that will be made available that uh, is not very well vetted and is just another big chunk of code that's in there that we don't really know what's going on with. Okay, so this paper right here that I have uh, provided to everybody, and I believe it is a PDF, and I'm not sure if I marked it. Yeah, it is a PDF. So uh, I will need to go back in there and actually mark that as a PDF. So I apologize if you clicked on it and got a PDF and you're unhappy. But uh, this is a very, very good white paper on the Linux security module framework. So if after this talk is done, if you would like to go and read this, uh, pull down the PDF using your favorite copy of Puppy Linux or whatever it is that you want to use on a USB thumb drive, and uh, take a look at it because it's a very, very good primer if you want to get into the technical aspects of what's going on with this. But I'm going to try to explain it very softly. So at one point, a whole bunch of people came forward and said, Linux is not security, secure enough for us, and we want to make some changes. And Linus Torvald said, you know what? You're, you're offering these changes, and I don't like them. He didn't say it this nice, OK? Like, don't. <laughs> I don't want anybody to think that this is exactly how he said it. but. What was said was, hey, you guys are offering a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, super good job. Yeah, I know this sounds exactly like him. Uh, really proud of you all, but we can't integrate this because it is not scalable. And this is not going to work for our needs. And so uh, he sent them all back to the drawing board, essentially. And what ended up happening was somebody implemented a method of being able to hook into the kernel in order to add security modules to it while not necessarily forcing anybody to use one type of security module over another. However, some distributions have made their decision. Uh, does anybody able to answer who's real big right now on AppArmor? Debian. So Debian, so Ubuntu. Ubuntu is very big on AppArmor right now. Can anybody tell me who's using SE Linux? Red Hat. Red Hat, yep. CentOS, Red Hat. So you do have your battle lines that are being drawn automatically by the people who are making the Linux distributions. Like you're, you're, you're already got a dog in the fight depending on who you're choosing as the, the group that you're gonna put on your computer or your laptop. So the LSM inserts a hook at every point in the kernel where a user can conduct a system call to import kernel objects. And this includes inodes and task control blocks. And this is done with a narrow scope that is intended to avoid large and complex change patches. That's all. So it's just adding areas where you can hook in to give you finer grain control over what you're touching whenever you're using your computer. But that means that we have to talk about mandatory access controls now, or MAC. So Linux in general uses DAC. Uh, discretionary access controls, I believe, is the uh, exact way of saying that. And what that means is, has anybody here ever used chmod or changemod? Yeah. yeah, a whole bunch of us. Hands are going to pop up all over the place right now. So uh, that allows us to say, OK, this user and this group can access a folder. That's all the DAC is. 
uh, for the most part. There's a little bit more to it, and we can get into sticky bits, and we can get into all kinds of different stuff as far as permissions go. But the, the breakdown is, is I'm saying who can read, who can write, and who can execute, whether it be myself or somebody else or only root or whatever. But uh, I have a relatively wide berth in terms of who's going to use my stuff. Like if you're a member of a group, then you can use this. But if you're not a member of that group, then you can't use it. Make sense so far? Okay, cool. I'm glad I, and I, glad I got that out correctly. So mandatory access control is a method by which an operating system limits access to or performance of an object or action. And generally, this is going to mean that requests for processes, threads, files, ports, or devices are managed based on a specific set of constraints that are tested against authorization rules. So now we're setting up policies and we're getting much more fine-grained. So we can literally say, yes, this user can run Firefox, or this user can run Chrome. But when Chrome pops up, they only have access to the Downloads folder, and they only have access to this uh, section of the operating system as opposed to this section of the operating system. You have extremely fine-grained control. Now, with that comes great responsibility and the potential to really mess things up. You can close stuff off that you can no longer access, or you can leave things extra, extra open, and under the impression that you have secured stuff, then you will feel very bad when you find out that you have not done so. So let's start with App Armor. Spoiler alerts. I like App Armor. Big fan. App Armor is, in my opinion, much simpler. It's much easier. Uh, there are more people who seem to be comfortable with it, and the tools available for you to be able to write policies with AMP Armor uh, seem more complete, in my opinion, and this is all just my opinion, and much easier to use. Okay? So, i big fan here. Take everything that I say with a grain of salt because I'm not saying that either one is better or worse than the other, okay? Even though AMP Armor is the best. So, I believe you. I've dealt with that before. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get to that as well because it is tough, especially for people who are not familiar with it. So what is AppArmor? Well, again, AppArmor is a Linux kernel security module that allows the user to restrict programs with the use of a profile specific to that application. We write a profile, we say what an application can do and what users can access it, and then at that point, whenever that application fires off, then only those specific items happen as we authorized. Now, these profiles are designed to delegate capabilities, and this is going to include things like sockets. It's going to include your network access, your file access, and more. Tons of stuff can all be affected by this, okay? And again, Canonical, the creators of Ubuntu, are known to be contributors to this security tool, okay? So again, if you've got a dog in the fight, this is where you start making decisions based off of distributions because certain companies are contributing to certain products, and for those people who disagree with policies or whatever with certain companies, then of course you need to make your decision from there. And of course, AppArmor is implemented through the LSM kernel interface. And I do feel, again, there it is, opinion right up there, AppArmor is an excellent alternative to the much more difficult to set up SE Linux. Now, I'm going to ask something real quick. Is anybody here using SE Linux on a personal box? No mandated. Is anybody using uh, MAC, any kind of mandatory access controls on a personal box? Is it App Armor? Okay. Is anybody using an alternative to SE Linux or App Armor? No? Okay. Is anybody aware that there are alternatives to App Armor and SE Linux? No? Okay. So in a minute, we'll get into just a few dr name drops for some of these products. Uh, there are alternatives to them as well. So if you're interested in other products, there's more stuff for you all to go out and research if you feel inclined to do so. Again, this is an overview and an introduction. It's not super in-depth, so I didn't go into any of these alternative products. I use Manjaro, big fan. So sudo pacman switch s app armor. And then you need to edit boot syslinux, syslinux.cfg. Of course, sudo vim, right? And then there's an append line where you can add app armor equals one, security equals app armor, right on that append line. And I, I point it all out. And uh, upon doing so, when you refresh, uh, reboot your box, you should have access to app armor. Okay? Uh, Manjaro doesn't come with app armor pre installed. 
but I like App Armor. Now, Ubuntu does come with it pre installed, as we talked about. But, yes? When you move to an App Armor, how does that affect the system when it's related to a domain and sign on with the domain and credentials and stuff like that? You know what? I don't feel qualified to answer that. Uh, upon my use of it, uh, it worked fine. And if there's any changes or anything like that, if you're using, like, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I, any kind of product for, for managing your usernames and passwords and having a domain and all that stuff, I wouldn't be able to tell you. So I guess be cautious. Be careful as you set it up. Can anybody here answer that? Can you answer that? No, I had another question. Okay. Uh, you said it's free installed on Ubuntu. Yes. Does that mean it's enabled or it's available? I don't believe it's enabled. I believe it's available and you can enable it yourself. Yeah. Do you have any knowledge of how hard it is to get it to work on a Red Hat system or a Zip system? I have never done it. Does anybody have a comment on, on adding App Armor to CentOS or Red Hat? I don't think that that's even a thing that you would want to do. Yeah. Like it's, it's a bit difficult. I know some people have done it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I don't know. I don't know the reasoning behind it, uh, other than you know somebody said, "Now nah, shall make it so." Um, but I do know a couple of systems have had to do that. Honestly. It'd just be easier to do that same stuff. Well, yeah. Uh, so my opinion is, is generally when you're picking a distribution, you want to pick your package manager, and you want to pick whether or not you're using App Armor or SE Linux, and that's kind of my two items where that's where I pick my dog. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that. Sorry. Um, so it it's installed on Ubuntu, but you don't know if it is on Debian. Is that right? I believe it's not on Debian. Correct? Yeah, I I, I just installed it at least because I had to install it. I should say. Yeah, you you had to add it yourself. It doesn't come like pre-installed. Right. Uh, you used app. App Armor, yeah. No app. Apt. Apt. Yes. Okay. Yes. So for Debian, yeah. As for Ubuntu. I, I, don't, I don't need it, so. Okay. So, history of App Armor. Uh, yes. So, since we're talking about installing it, uh, I haven't looked at packages specifically to do with SE Linux and App Armor, but I know a lot of other packages come in where you have a tool that might not be installed, and but the package knows how to deal with that tool. So, if you've previously installed SSH and then you go out add App Armor, they automatically work with each other to go, hey, this is how SSH and App Armor get along. Yes. Right? Um, so and that comes from the profiles, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to install some sane defaults in terms of profiles. OK. Yeah. So I, just, I, I, like I, said, I just haven't looked at it in these, for these. Well, I haven't looked at it in 15 years, and back then, SE Linux didn't. Um, right. <laughs> fun days. So App Armor, history of it, right? Uh, it began as an application known as subdomain. That was what it was originally called. And it was part of a, a defunct product called Immunix OS. Anybody ever use that? I had never even heard about it until I started doing research, to be honest with you. But Novell acquired Immunix, and they rebranded the subdomain application as AppArmor. And then at that port, Point, they began proce the process of porting the application to Linux proper. Eventually, SUSE came along and became the legal owner of the trademark name. I don't know how they did that or what ended up happening with that. I just know that SUSE got a hold of it. And then upon doing so, for whatever reason, AppArmor was ported to Ubuntu back in 2007. And now that's kind of where we sit today. So 10 years of it being an Ubuntu-ish well-known product. What about policies? So now that we have a history of it, how do we set this thing up? Well, my favorite place to send people is the Arch Wiki. And as far as configuration is concerned, this is a great place as far as uh, uh, resources go for you to come here and take a look at this. I have the installation. I have usage. I have a whole bunch of stuff in here, uh, particularly on how uh, profiles are parsed, uh, how to disable the loading of profiles. Tons of stuff there. In addition to that, I went out and found one of the App Armor developers and found their web page. And if archive.is decides to cooperate, I have a comprehensive guide to App Armor here as well. And this is written by the App Armor developer. Again, this is a must read. 
So if you're interested in AppArmor and this is a product you want to look at, make sure that you're reading the ArchWiki and then be sure to actually hit the documentation that is provided for you by the developers of AppArmor. Now, again, AppArmor is a supplement to DAC. So it provides mandatory access controls on top of our discretionary access controls. So that means just because we have installed AppArmor does not mean that we're just getting rid of the permission system in its entirety, okay? We're adding an additional layer to how we do things. In addition to that, AppArmor is really cool because it comes with the tools necessary for you to begin making the profiles that you're going to use. Uh, and the, the individual who wrote the documentation that I just referenced actually has a very, very clear method on taking an application, turning on AppArmor, making sure that that application essentially fails, and then working your way through the log item by item until you get the application running under AppArmor. So it breaks it down for you. Uh, when AppArmor can't, when AppArmor protects things and an application can no longer access them, generally that application will fail and it'll come back and say, hey, I can't open a socket, or I can't access these files, or I can't do X, Y, or Z. And at that point, the application fails out, closes with an error, and then you can run through the logs and individually open those items until the system works. Yes? Does this mean AppArmor really only deals with uh, the Mac from the application view and not just file access view? Uh, so my understanding that it is application-wide. So my, my answer to you is I believe it's only on the application side, but if I'm wrong, I apologize. But as far as I saw, everything that I was working with in, in creating this talk was entirely application specific. Now, I'm not a big background in SE Linux other than I've mentioned it in my classes and stuff when teaching because it's the only one I knew that was Mac oriented. But my understanding was that uh, SE Linux actually had the file um, system under uh, Mac. Is that correct or incorrect? Uh, SE Linux does put like essentially everything as far as I know under Mac. Yeah, because your files are under the Mac, your your applications are under the Mac, your uh, I mean all the way down to if you're running a web browser or I'm sorry a web server like Apache then you have to specifically say hey these are certain files that the Apache can actually serve and so on and so forth. Thank you. Yes. So use cases. What are we going to actually use this for? Uh, when I was writing this, I was writing it specifically to encourage people here and elsewhere to look at this in terms of actually deploying this on their personal systems, if at all possible. Generally, we're running SE Linux or AppArmor, depending on our choice of server, within the data center. That's where this would normally be located, right? But these are tools that are made available to you that you can still use at home. And again, as a big fan of AppArmor and the AppArmor profiles being so simple, in my opinion, uh, in order to integrate into your, uh, your threat matrix, I feel like it would be something that would be wise for you to add. AppArmor also comes with very sane defaults, good defaults. So if you have like Firefox, or some of those similar programs, AppArmor is already going to come with profiles specifically for deployment on those applications, okay? Uh, and if you're a developer, do we have some developers in here? Yeah, a few of us, right? If you're a developer and you are working with AppArmor and you find something that breaks under AppArmor and you're able to repair it, please, please, please consider going to the GitHub and adding your profile to them as a pull request so you can try to integrate that, okay? Can't recommend it enough. We're all here to work together, so if you can contribute, please do so. Now we need to touch on SE Linux real quick before we push forward into FireJail, where FireJail is really going to take all of this stuff and really bring it together. SE Linux, again, mandatory access control. This one, however, comes from our friends at the NSA. Yay. And this defines the access and transition rights of every user, application, process, and file on the system. This is a very honed method over the traditional discretionary access control in which an application or process runs as a UID or SUID and then inherits the permissions of 
uh, to all objects available to a user. So if I, as a user, kick off Chrome or Firefox, that application without MAC is going to inherit my permissions. And that application then has access to stuff that I have access to. So uh, everybody here familiar with the idea of using a web browser and then gaining a uh, crypto locker on your system? So you're doing something with your web browser and then the web browser kicks off a file and crypto locker runs and then all your stuff gets encrypted? Then that's because that application was able to just jump using your permissions, okay? Now this changes that. SE Linux assists in protecting the system from malicious or flawed applications by limiting the access to files, sockets, and other processes that the application can access. Same thing with AppArmor, but we're just focusing on SE Linux now. And SE Linux itself actually uh, functions in a very simple method in that the processes will perform an action request. It then asks to, let's say, read a file. That request is intercepted by SE Linux who then goes and checks, hey, uh, does this have access to that? Uh, it uses something called an access vector cache, and that stores subject and object permissions. So really what it's doing is your application comes forward and says, I need access to this file. SE Linux takes a look and says, OK, anywhere in here does it say that this application can have access to this file? If it finds it, it says great, and then it passes that on. And if it doesn't find it, it says you can't have this, and at which point, generally, those applications will fail out. So if policy is found, again, it's a yes or no. And if yes, returned. If not, uh, it also will always generate an AVC denied message, so you can actually watch your logs and you will see in your logs when things are being denied. Again, PDF, excellent SE Linux users and administrator guide provided by Red Hat. Again, dog in a fight. You're using SE Linux, Red Hat's going to be your go-to place for all your documentation. There's tons of PDFs, there's lots of documentation on how to set it up, how to implement it, so on and so forth. And then uh, I also produced a mirror of that exact same file because I wasn't sure just reading how stuff was done I wasn't exactly sure if I was allowed to reproduce that or not and so I created a mirror but I also linked you directly to theirs but if it ever disappears just use the mirror That's odd. yeah I try to be very careful with the permissions and stuff but I at that point I just pushed it so SE Linux project they're on github and there it is. That's where you can go to follow along with all the code and who's contributing and so on and so forth. And then in addition to that, super spooky. Look at that. It's the NSA. Uh-oh. Um, they actually have very detailed instructions on uh, how they use it, sort of how they implement it, some of the history of it, so on and so forth. The NSA is not like shy or anything like that about telling you what they developed and how they developed it, okay? Uh, I used an archive.is to reproduce this just so that I'm not sending a bunch of people to the NSA's webpage in case they feel like nervous about that. Like I know everybody gets weird, right? So uh, if you're interested in doing so, this is an archive, uh, but you can actually go to their webpage and they've got tons of information there. In addition, I went ahead and I would like to actually read this to you because this is word for word how they feel about SE Linux and their development of this, okay? So NSA, Security Enhanced Linux, is a set of patches to the Linux kernel and utilities to provide a strong, flexible, mandatory access control architecture into the major subsystems of the kernel. It provides an enhanced mechanism to enforce the separation of information based on confidentiality, uh, and integrity requirements, which allows threats of tampering and bypassing of application security mechanisms to be addressed and enables the confinement of damage that can be caused by malicious or flawed applications. It includes a set of sample security policy configuration files designed to meet common and general purpose security goals. And uh, I believe this is also an archive, but I'm going to check. No, it is not. So this is the information assurance mission of the NSA. <coughs> Excuse me. The IAD may actually not load because you have to be running 
uh, yeah, so it comes back and it says this connection is not private. You have to be running their stuff on your computer in order to get this to work. And they ask you to download things and install it. Okay? So head on over to the NSA and download their stuff and put that into your web browser. And then upon doing so, then you can have access to their stuff. Uh, use your favorite copy of Puppy Linux installed on a USB drive, right? Okay, if you want to review this stuff, grab yourself a virtual machine, do something different. Do not just willy-nilly jam this stuff into your favorite copy of Firefox, okay? Uh, that's my recommendation to you. You all heard it here first. But what is that? Well, that's the information assurance mission of the NSA. And that web page uh, is a, um, it's an explain station for the important role of not only ferreting out information, but also safeguarding it. And that directive means that they are duty bound to partner with government, industry, and academia to defend our nation. That's their message, okay? Uh, so we've all read the Snowden stuff, sort of, right? Uh, the message is there, that's what they tell you. Um, if you want to get that SSL certificate, I have a little bit of an explanation and everything else that you need up there. You can follow along. Uh, I will leave it up to you, but many of these DOD web pages do require this root and intermediate certificate authority. Root authority. Okay? So I'll leave it at that. Be careful what you're installing on your browser. It's mean, just a certificate. If it's a certificate, it's a certificate. But if it's actually like any sort of program. So with that certificate, they can do, all, they can do other stuff. Once you start installing certificates that are from other people's items, uh, if that certificate is within your browser and you're communicating, potentially they can go in there and uh, decrypt your SSL. Now, there's other ways around that too. I mean, it's not, there's, there, you have a lot of options there, but uh, again, that's why I'm saying, if you're gonna install it, make sure that you don't do it in a way that it's persistent. So, now that we know that SE Linux was originally created as a project by the NSA, uh, they did have assistance from others. I want to make that clear. It's not just an NSA project. They did have a whole bunch of other people who contributed to it. Uh, and it is an implementation of the Flask architecture for operating system security. Again, Flask architecture uses Mac as an administratively defined security policy to control all subjects and objects while basing all access decisions on that set policy. And Flask is a least privileged method for task rights, which is good. Uh, does everybody understand the concept of least privilege? Okay. For those of you who don't understand the concept of least privilege, what it means is, is whenever we're connecting to something or doing something, what we want is for us to not be able to do anything more than that thing. So uh, it's one thing, only one thing, and be good at that one thing. So least privilege means that uh, I don't want my web browser to be able to not only access my downloads folder, but also forward slash root, okay? Like, all I want is forward slash home, forward slash Aaron, forward slash downloads, and then that's what you get. We want it to have as little privilege as possible, so if there is ever a problem, they can't escalate out of that and cause me harm in more directions. So again, SE Linux is integrated into your kernel as an LSM framework. It's using that, uh, those hooks that are made available by the kernel. And uh, the original SE Linux was not scalable. It was a huge problem, and it's one of the reasons why uh, the LSM framework was developed. SE Linux comes forward, they try to implement it, it's terrible, and it's not scalable, and it's causing tons and tons of problems with the kernel. Uh, Linus Torvalds uh, sent them a very loving and supportive message, and then they were told to go back to the drawing board. Uh, upon doing so, they then came back with a second edition that uh, became a loadable kernel module, but again, it had issues with scaling and support of file systems. So at that point, they came back with a third, a third implementation that then had full support for LSM and better support for all file systems. And upon doing this, that iteration has become a joint effort between the NSA, Red Hat, and a community of SE Linux developers. So there's a whole bunch of people that began contributing to that, and Red Hat became a major contributor. Again, pick your dog. Uh, this right here, 
is the NSA guide to configuring the SE Linux policy. Okay? So, again, if you want to be able to configure SE Linux, you can go here and you can pull this. And that gives you an idea of what they're trying to accomplish, how they're trying to accomplish, and how to do it the NSA method. I don't go much beyond that on account of the fact that it's difficult. It takes a lot of effort. And uh, in addition to that, one of the things that I have witnessed out in my experience is that oftentimes somebody will set up SE Linux. And upon using SE Linux, things start to break. And at that point, they pendulum swing in the opposite direction and they just start opening stuff. And then they swing back and it goes back and forth until the system is improperly configured or has a whole bunch of problems or they have simply uh, gotten to the point where they turn it off. So that's what I've seen from people who are not super familiar with SE Linux. Whereas with AppArmor, it's a lot easier to just grab a policy, stick it in a folder, and then let the thing run. However, SE Linux is extremely powerful. Uh, it's very, very granular. There's tons of control, but all of that is going to breed complexity. Okay. Something else to think about with your use cases. Government, pretty big on SE Linux, yes. SE Linux is, is more appropriate for um, systems that are uh, configured and locked down. Oh yeah, like set it up and then forget it as, as much as you possibly can. Can you manage it like code? Like, sure. Yeah, if you're trying to do it manually or uh, like a custom uh, admin deploy, it, there's just too much. Oh yeah, it's very, very granular, very difficult. Um, again, if you're going to run into this stuff out in real life, you're going to see it. Data centers, you're going to see it in government-related stuff. Uh, especially out here in Arizona, tons of places are using Red Hat. Uh, and therefore, ergo, they're using SE Linux. Uh, we've already kind of beat this horse to death, but I'm just going to go over it. Yes. So uh, a friend of mine is fairly high up in the tech chain over at Red Hat. Uh -huh. And uh, this person told me one year that there they, have been a whole bunch of security problems that we had in, in the Linux environment. And this is before the CPU issues. So this is actually our software. Uh, and they said if, if SE Linux had been enabled, then none of those turned into an exploit. All the things that were, there was an exploit in the software, SE Linux by default being turned on, would have blocked every single one of the, the CVEs that were exploited. The, so, 100%, that sounds absolutely correct, but the issue that I see is people will enable it, and then they start adding things to the system or making changes, and at that point stuff starts breaking, and then again we run into either they turn it off or they configure it incorrectly. Yeah. So, but the point, yeah, so you can't just turn it on and, and magic happen. Correct. You still need to know what it is. You still need to admin it properly. You still need to develop properly for yes. it. But what, what you've been saying is this is this can be a really nice additional layer for your security. And in this particular case, getting word back from within the company yeah. that they're seeing fantastic results with it when it's used properly. Yep, absolutely. It's that, that properly part. Yeah. And that's always the tough part. So now that we've gone through, yeah. I was just going to say, so it sounds like it's just an enterprise level tool that really, shouldn't be really used on any sort of personal level. Well, again, it's your skill set. Skill set and the capability. My skill set and capability makes me like AppArmor because it's easier for me to deploy. Uh, so let's get into sandboxing. So this is your, your third piece. So we want a properly set up, let's say, web browser. And we want to make sure that we understand our threat profile and we want to understand where they can attack us. Can they get in using CSS? Well, there's a CVE that says that they can, so yeah. Uh, can they get in through JavaScript? Absolutely. Are we concerned about that with certain web pages over certain other web pages? Absolutely. Uh, has anybody here ever uh, been a victim of any of the JavaScript attacks that were performed using YouTube? So there was individuals who were using JavaScript in order to inject into YouTube videos, so in the comments, uh, they would add code and then that code would fire and they were able to DDoS computers using JavaScript that was uploaded into YouTube comments. Okay? So that's a thing that we have to worry about, right? That's an issue. Uh, 
So what I want to talk about is something that won't maybe necessarily protect exactly against that. But again, it goes between, hey, what's my threat profile? What am I worried about? What are the things that concern me? And then how can I defend myself? So now that we have talked about AppArmor and SE Linux, and maybe we've decided, OK, you know what? I'm going to sit down over the weekend, and I'm going to implement AppArmor. And I'm going to start experimenting with that. Well, let's also go over sandboxing. Anybody here still use Windows? Yeah, a few of us, right? So a couple of people. Or at the very least, is anybody here having to use uh, a Linux computer on a mixed network where you're with people who are using Windows? Yeah, OK, sure. So even more hands. Uh, or work. So you need to be a good neighbor. Let's put it that way. Like we should be. Even though we're Linux users and so on and so forth, we need to be good neighbors because we do interact with people who are not using Linux. We interact with people who are using mixed systems. There's all kinds of stuff out in the world, and we kind of have to be part of that world, right? So upon doing so, I want you all to understand that everything that I'm going to talk about here tonight is Linux-centric, but there is a Windows component to this. There is a program called Sandboxy. And so if you are using Windows and you're interested in sandboxing your applications, you can implement Sandboxy in order to uh, help defend against certain attacks. Uh, I generally, if I'm dealing with a family member and I have to deal with Windows, uh, I will install Sandboxy and then run their uh, web browser through it. And then uh, if they download anything that's going to fire off and perhaps perchance start uh, crypto lockering their system or whatever, all that is done within a sandbox. And then uh, all they have to do is close the web browser and open it back up and all of their files are still safe. Okay, sandboxy is great. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about fire jail. So there are tons and tons of methods by which you can sandbox an application. And the word sandboxing is kind of vague because we have lots of different ways of doing it. You can do a full system virtualization with something like VirtualBox, uh, QEMU, those things, yeah, everybody's good. OK, good. Uh, you can use alternative methods like Docker. Or you can use a tool like FireJail. And that's going to provide an SUID method of sandboxing. And I want you to understand that no matter what choice you make, you still have to understand that there's always going to be benefits and weaknesses. You can download a file into a virtual machine. And you can open that file, and it will run just fine. And then when you pull it out of that virtual machine, and you run it somewhere else, or you send it down the chain, it will then fire off and actually execute its exploits. Because there is computer programming uh, APIs that are designed specifically for being able to identify whether or not an application is existing inside of a virtual machine. Okay, So none of this stuff is super perfect. Like We can't just pick one method, and then we're good to go. So we got to layer, layers of security, right? So fire jail. Got a link to the web page. It looks kind of janky. Yeah, I, that's WordPress, OK? The web page itself looks a little janky, but uh, the application itself is fairly good. So this is an SUID program that reduces the risk of security breaches by restricting the running environment of an application using Linux namespaces in conjunction, conjunction with setcomp BPF. Um, really, what this boils down to, because there's a whole bunch of technical mumbo jumbo here, what it really, really boils down to is the fact that FireJail works in order to tell an application, hey, there are very specific things that you can have access to, and you can use it in conjunction with something like AppArmor for your MAC. Okay, So the MS MAC can make a decision on sockets. It can make a decision on files. It can make a decision on all of that stuff. And then your sandboxing can essentially say, OK, that's great, but they only have access to a specific folder. Uh, so everything that's downloaded goes to that folder. And in addition to that, if the application tries to write anything, it can only write to that specific folder. So we can create a folder called Firefox. And we can run Firefox in FireJail. And if Firefox is attacked and, and, and successful execution of code is run, all that code is only going to be run in a very specific folder space, theoretically. Okay? Obviously, there's potentially weaknesses. But theoretically, uh, if something were to happen and it was a, going to attempt to make an attack, maybe it only crypto lockers the stuff in that folder. But guess what? Every time you turn off your browser, you clean out that folder so you lose nothing. Ways of doing things. 
Uh, Fire Jail is written in C and has absolutely no dependencies. And since the entire application is just a simple implementation of tools available directly to the kernel, uh, you are going to have C no impact to the speed of applications and very little resource overhead. Uh, Fire Jail, again, implements profiles so it can be used with a, right, a wide array of applications and provides sandboxing for everything from web browsers to web servers and all of the tools in between. It's a fantastic tool. Can't sing the praises of Fire Jail enough and you can use it for everything from running your uh, Apache to Nginx to your Firefox to VLC uh, to several other tools. Uh, something to keep in mind, we've talked about this before. Does anybody here remember when I, I told you all about the, the individual who was arrested because he was, um, uh, he was exploiting a young lady and forcing her to send images and videos of her uh, in compromising situations? Uh, that gentleman was using Tor and several other things in order to hide his identity. And so what they did was they took a file and they turned it into a video. And that video had a call to a socket, essentially, that would call out and pull metadata. Well, the metadata that it was asking for was coming from a server that that law enforcement agency had access to so they would be able to see the IP address. Okay, everybody follow? So you run this video, the video pops up, Windows Media Player uh, goes out and says, hey, I need all the metadata for this file right here. That makes a connection from the system to a server somewhere, and then that's how they're able to identify you while getting around Tor and things like that. Okay, makes sense, right? This is kind of old hat. So if you're concerned about sending files or videos or pictures, hopefully not for illegal purposes, right? Like I don't, I don't want that, but if you're concerned about, hey, I want to be able to send a file to somebody or I want to be able to receive a file from somebody without the concern of that file being used to uh, unmask me if I'm a, let's say I'm a reporter or I'm uh, somebody who's dealing with a situation in which people may potentially want to cause me harm. Fire Jail in conjunction with something like SE Linux or AppArmor allows you to say, okay, I'm going to run VLC but VLC does not have access to the sockets or the ports or anything else necessary in order to reach out and get information uh, from servers to get metadata. And so therefore, that exploit that worked on that gentleman's computer in order to unmask him, therefore would not work uh, whenever your system is attacked with that avenue. <sighs> Neat. So, it is also important to note that there are pieces of AppArmor that will only function on Ubuntu distributions, okay? And this limitation may be changing by the end of this year, maybe early next year, uh, but they are still working on that. So other applications may start implementing more items, but there are a list of things, and I will leave it up to you all to go look it up, but uh, there are things that only AppArmor running under Ubuntu can do that uh, is not available whenever you're running app or under other operating systems. So let's answer these questions. Oh, and by the way, tonight's probably going to be pretty short. Uh, the Linux security module interface is a framework for allowing the Linux kernel to support many different computer security modules without advertising for or prioritizing one over the other. Now, excuse me, the currently accepted modules in the official kernel are AppArmor, SE Linux, Smack, Tomoyo, Linux, and Yama, okay? So th that's your list of those applications that I was telling you about that are alternatives to SE Linux and to AppArmor. Now a sandbox is a security mechanism for collecting resources and providing them to an application without allowing that application to modify or otherwise access resources outside the agreed upon isolated em environment. I'm sorry, I just realized under Fire Jail, I didn't add the commands on how to run it but it's really easy. You type in fire jail, space, Firefox, or Chrome, or VLC, and you hit enter. They have really nice documentation as well. And it is within the documentation, yep, absolutely. Like we use the documentation, the good stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, fire jail. F-I-R-E-J-A-I-L. AppArmor profiles can be developed through the use of the AppArmor audit framework, and commands will include audit CTL, AU search, and AU report. All of those commands are available through the ArchWiki, as well as through that um, gentleman's webpage on uh, how he worked on creating AppArmor, 
And so there's very, very detailed instructions there on exactly how to run these commands, how to audit, and how to eventually build your own profiles. What about sandboxing? Well, sandboxing can protect a system from malicious code by preventing access to important system files, memory, or the mechanisms necessary to write permanent changes to the host operating system. Again, layers of security, layers. We use strong passwords. We use Linux, first of all. Uh, we want to use things like AppArmor. We want to increase uh, security by implementing an MAC of our choice like AppArmor. We want to use sandboxing in order to defend the application so that even if uh, harmful code is run, hopefully we can limit the number of things that that code is able to access. Uh, in addition to that, we want to pay attention to how we're accessing the internet. So of course, VPNs, uh, we want to be a good neighbor, so you might be running ClamAv. Everybody familiar with ClamAv? Yeah, sort of, okay. Uh, the antivirus, so ClamAv will run on your server, it'll run on your personal laptop, it'll run on Windows, it runs everywhere. ClamAv is a great tool. I actually have some documentation on ClamAv on my site that you can find. Great way of uh, searching through files and making sure they're safe before passing them on to somebody else within your household. Uh, and SE Linux is a Linux kernel security module for managing access control policies created originally from projects developed by the United States National Security Agency. <coughs> so, what do we need to remember? Well, A, no operating system is perfect. We're never going to be 100% safe and there's no way to lock everything down to where you're completely defended, okay? But what we can do is we can enhance our security over the competition, but in addition to that, it can always be improved. Uh, you as a user are going to need to be able to make your own decisions on what your, threat it's, what your threats exist as, what you are concerned about, and how you plan to defend yourself from those threats. Because remember, for every item that you take out of this class and you go implement, that's your time, that's your effort. That changes to your system, and of course that also changes the footprint for how your system can be potentially attacked or what kind of vulnerabilities you add to your system. For every piece of code we implement, obviously somebody else could have implemented something as a counter to that, right? Fine-tuned control of applications using things like AppArmor or SE Linux are great to enhance your safety, but they also increase complexity and that could present another avenue of attack. If you don't know what you're doing or you're not prepared for it, potentially you're going to harm yourself or you're going to harm your company or whoever it is that you are implementing this for. Now, I do recommend, even if you're not ready to implement something like an MAC and you don't want to get involved in that, I do recommend on any Linux-based system to run FireJail. Run it, deploy it, learn how it works, because regardless of your need for a Mac, I cannot sing the praises of FireJail enough. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, this simple tool can be deployed on an innumerable number of applications. They're all just profiles. And uh, if you're going to be running a web browser, I really recommend that you run FireJail in conjunction with that web browser because it will, as a sane default for something like GNU IceCat, Firefox, Chrome, uh, Chromium, uh, Midori, a whole bunch of different web browsers, this automatically locks you down to really just your downloads folder. And then at that point, uh, if something were to be able to be ran from the browser, uh, it's going to really, really reduce the amount of damage that could potentially be done. As long as you're not living out of your downloads folder. Like if you keep literally everything that you work on in your downloads folder, it's not going to save you, okay? That's even saving. Yes. So. Final recommendations, use Linux, implement safe security practices, understand what your operating system provides, and be a good neighbor. Learn what you need to do to defend yourself, but also make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on around you so you can assist others. Any other questions? No? Okay, cool. Well, we're going to actually be done uh, kind of early today. So that's fantastic. You all can hang out for a little bit or head on out or whatever it is that you want to do. I want to thank you all for coming out and spending your evening with me. And uh, again, if you have any questions or if you want to reach out to me or anything like that, you all know I'm always uh, trying to make myself available. So thank you very much. Thank you.